Well, good morning, Harvest. Good morning. So glad to hear that. Um, Well, my name is Daniel Meyer. I have the privilege of serving on staff here. And our pastor, Pastor Paul, he is out of the pulpit this weekend and next weekend, but we'll be back in two weeks. So look forward to that. Be praying for him as he takes a break. And uh, and, uh, bless him and his wife with your prayers, please. Uh, Today's message is from 2 Peter chapter 1. We're going to be dealing with uh, verses 5 to 11. So you can turn there in your Bibles, 2 Peter chapter 1, 5 to 11. And, and, the, and the message today is called, I know that I know. I know that I know. And uh, really, this is a message about my assurance of salvation, about your assurance of salvation. Uh, being in the church a while, this conversation comes up every now and then about, well, how do you know that you're saved? Talking about the doctrine of assurance or the perseverance of the saints and uh, knowing that you're a child of God. And so I would ask people and be like, well, how do you know? Like, tell me how. How do you know that you're saved? And, And the response I would get is, well, I know that I know. And, and I guess that's an okay answer because in, in Romans 8.16, it says that the Spirit himself is, is, uh, is uh, ministering to our spirit and, and, and bearing witness that we are uh, childs of God. So, yeah, there is this internal knowledge that God gives us that we know that we know. But I, I want some empirical evidence, all right? I want to be able to see how can I know for sure in my life that the feeling I have isn't just my thoughts. That I want to see in my life that this is true and that I can know that I know. Well, Peter, luckily, thankfully, uh, in his uh, letter here, tells us how we can know and have assurance of our salvation. You see, assurance is crucial to the life of a believer. If you don't have assurance of your salvation, then you're going to live your life in doubt. You're going to live your life in uncertainty. You're going to live your life um, questioning the promises of God because you don't know what there is for you at the end of this life. But if you know and have confidence in what's coming, then you will have assurance and then you will want to live for the Lord. So the question here today is, how can I have assurance of my salvation? Well, I'm so glad you asked. So why don't you stand with me and we'll read from God's word from 2 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 5, says this, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we gather here this morning to seek you. Lord, we gather here as your church this morning, God, that we might hear from the voice of God and that you would change us, O Lord. As we humble ourselves before you, God, we ask the question, how can I become more like Jesus Christ? O Lord, would you teach us from your word? Lord, would your presence be in this place moving, O God, as we open your holy scriptures and and learn what you have written to us? God, we ask that you would be honored as we receive a word. Lord, we love you, God. We bless you now. Be with us, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Please take your seats. You may have noticed that our text today started with this phrase, for this very reason. And the correct question there is, well, for what reason? What are you talking about, all right? And so in verses three and four, Peter lays out what the reason is. And so I'm gonna summarize it quickly for us. Basically, what Peter says in verses three and four is that God has granted us all things pertaining to life and godliness. 
God has also granted us um, great promises of what is to come and that we can become partakers of this divine nature, escaping from the corruption that is the world because of sinful desire. And so what Peter is setting up here, and this is really setting up for the rest of the book, but what he is setting up here is that we have a great promise and hope of our future. God has granted us that promise. God has also granted us the ability to live godly lives today, and so we should, all right? And so, Verse five starts, he says, well, for this very reason, since this is true for you, believer, since this is true, since you have accepted Christ as your savior, you have received these things for this very reason, and let's look at the text, what does it say? It says, make every effort to supplement your faith. Make every effort to supplement your faith. And so our first point today is this, if, if I want to be sure that my faith is real, if I want to be positive that my faith is real, I need to add to it. I need to add to it. This doesn't mean that your faith is insufficient. This doesn't mean that it's not enough to save you, because remember in Ephesians 2, 8, it says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, this is not your own doing, it is a gift of God. There is nothing you can do, there's no work you can complete that would get you righteous before God. It's all based on what Jesus has done. But Peter is writing to believers. He's writing to those who have already been saved. And this message today is, is to you believers, to you who are saved in Jesus Christ but seeking for assurance and how we can get that assurance. Well, if you want this assurance of salvation, we need to add to it. We need to supplement. You see that in the text? He says, supplement your faith. Add to it. Come alongside it. Not that your faith, is, faith isn't sufficient, but with your faith will come these things. Peter lists these seven or eight essential qualities of the person who knows they are saved. First being faith. Do we have a belief in God? Are we growing that virtue? Or it could be translated uh, moral excellence, uh, knowledge, are we seeking for, for God's wisdom and, and not man's uh, self-control to have mastery over your earthly passions, steadfastness, or it could be translated a perseverance or patience, a godliness, a, a heart that is kindled towards God's own heart, brotherly affection, um, making sure that we have love for the people who are right next to us in the pew today, in the church, brotherly affection. Do we love our brothers and sisters in the Lord? And then finally, love. Go on to love all people. In Galatians 5, we see a very similar list, almost identical actually, and, and we learn that this list that should be exhibited in us is the fruit of the Spirit. And it's the Spirit's work in us that allows this to take place. So you can't have these qualities in your life. You can't be adding to your faith with these things unless you have faith. Because it's the Spirit of God who's going to be doing this work within you. You have to let God increase these things in you through His Spirit and allow the fruit of the Spirit to shine through. The point is here, loved ones, that we are not to be satisfied with where we are, where we are at in our faith. We, we're not to be content with just being saved, but we want to add to it and become more and more like Christ. Don't settle, strive to be more like Christ. So this is the first step into knowing that we are saved, to knowing that our faith is real, is that we're adding to it, taking advantage of this godlike nature that we have been granted and promised. We're working and pursuing towards these eight godly qualities. Okay, let me put it in this way, all right? So there's a lot of athletes in our church, and so this is quite applicable to us. Uh, imagine someone is running for a marathon, or they're practicing, training for a marathon. And so every day, uh, they head out to the track, and they start increasing their distances, and, and they start to build up that mental strength it takes to run for 42, what is it, 42.6 kilometers? Are you crazy? Right? But to run that kind of distance and it takes a lot of work and a lot of time on the track. Uh, but someone who's competing for a race isn't just going to go out and run on the track every day. No, they're going to supplement their training with a good diet. They're gonna supplement their, their training with the proper equipment and shoes so that they don't injure themselves. 
They're going to supplement their training with going to the gym and, and growing in muscle strength so that they can compete at a higher level. This is what it's talking about. Or uh, imagine you're a person uh, who comes into a large sum of money from an inheritance. You're not just going to sit on that money. That would be, that'd be foolish. But what you're going to do is you're going to invest and you're going to diversify that portfolio or at least you're going to stick it in the bank and get some interest off it to increase it. You're supplementing uh, the money that you have been given. If we receive the gift of God, the salvation gift from God, and sit on it and don't add to it, we are like a runner training for a marathon but eating terrible food every day. We need to add to it. If we don't, it's foolish, it's a waste. Uh, look at the text again. Not only do we supplement it, but what does it say right before that? It says, make every effort to supplement your faith. Make every effort to supplement your faith. And, and throughout our text today, Peter keeps um, building up this urgency surrounding this. I, I find so often I can read through the Bible, and, and maybe you're just like me, and you can kind of skip over the intent that the writer has, and, and we kind of just read through it and, and kind of miss the urgency or, or these little tidbits like make every effort. Well, what does make every effort really mean? What, he, what he's saying is, is uh, do whatever you can, right? At all costs, supplement your faith. Make sure this is the priority, right? Don't let another day go by without supplementing your faith, we got to make sure this is a priority in our life. At times in my life, priorities can be so far off track. Forgetting to live my life for the glory of God, to grow in these things, to, to really be all in for Christ, to let my heart not lean towards things uh, that matter, but, but towards the world. We need to make it our life's mission to be progressing in godliness, to be progressing in these virtues. Are we making it every effort to grow in faith, virtue, knowledge, self-control, steadfastness, godliness, brotherly affection, and love? Well, let's keep moving in our text here to verse eight and nine. Read along with me. It says, for if these qualities are yours and increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. So often um, when preparing to, to preach, uh, uh, the, the speaker, the pastor, will um, be afraid of isolating large parts of the congregation. Right? You, you, you give an example, or you make an illustration, or, and, and it doesn't apply to many people. Right? Or, or maybe you're just preaching on a text that lends itself to, say, husbands instead of wives that week. And so a, a large portion of the congregation isn't getting all of the information or, or really sinking into them. Well, Peter here um, really hits the nail on the head because this applies to every single person who is a believer of Jesus Christ in the room. Every single person here who has put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ is affected by these two verses. He, he, he sets up two options when it comes to making every effort to supplement. He, he makes two kind of people distinct, and, and either you fit into option A or you do fit into B. There is no in-between. Everyone is affected by this. And so our second point here is we can have assurance of salvation if we own it. You see that in the text at the beginning of 8? It says, for if these qualities are yours, if these qualities are yours, Peter, after going through this list, he, he says, make them yours, all right? Make them yours, increase in them. You, you might hear these every week. You might read about them every day in your devotions, but have you made them yours in, in your life? In, in your thoughts, are you relying on corporately the church is growing in these things, but you personally are not growing in these things? Have you made it yours, not somebody else's, 
Not your parents, not the good friends around you, but yours. Are you making every effort? Are you making this yours? And are you increasing in it? You have to own it personally. It must become yours. He also says that it has to be increasing. It's yours and increasing. And he's building on this. It's not really two different things. He's not being repetitive, though, but he's making sure you understand that if these are yours, they will be increasing. And if they are increasing in your life, well, the only way that can happen is if they are yours. It's a package deal. If you own this, you will increase in this. Uh, let me give you an example of what this isn't, all right? So, um, Okay, have, have any of you on December 31st or January 1st made one of those New Year's resolutions? And right about this time of the year, it's supposed to be actually happening, right? So, it's a good check-in, everyone? You've been completing it? No. Well, on January 1st, a lot of people say, you know what, I'm gonna get that gym membership, I'm gonna work out every day. And I'm going to be beach body ready by July 17th. Well, it's July 17th, right? And so on January 2nd, we go to the gym and uh, we're like, all right, all right, all right, I'm into this. And, and, and we're walking around looking at all the shiny equipment and we're like, yeah, I could do that, I could do that. The, 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 the weightlifter, bodybuilder employee, you know, the, who looks the way you want to look, all, you know, in shape and shirts don't fit. And, and, and you're there and he's selling you on the towel upgrades and, and you're paying like 50, 60 bucks a month by the time you're out of there and you're like, I feel good, I'm gonna go to the gym. I'm paying for it, I'm gonna go, right? And then that first week you're at the gym like every day and then by the second week you go and you're just really looking at the weights, pretending to use them and you're like, oh, I got dressed and uh, it's time to go. And, and then by the third week you're not even at the gym anymore but you're too embarrassed to cancel your membership so you just keep on paying for it every single month. Anyone else or is that just me? Just me. And then it's on your keys, right? And it's on your keys and you can show people that you have a gym membership but you never have been there. <laughs> right? Or it's like that treadmill that may or may not be collecting dust and isn't assembled in my garage, right? Bought it with all the intention of the world of running on it and it's in my garage. Yeah. Yeah. This isn't like that. If you have this membership, you are using it. If you own this, you will be increasing in it. If you are increasing in this, it's only because you have owned it. It's not like a gym membership. It's not like a club you pay for. It's a gift from God, and if it's real, it's growing. It's growing. It's growing. See, no one here can say that this text doesn't apply to them. Nobody. Um, I don't mean to hurt your feelings, but nobody here is perfect. We're all still becoming like Christ. And so since none of us can say that we're perfect, none of us can say, oh, you know what, I used to own and increase in it, but now I just own it because I've increased as much as I possibly can. No, no, no. This, this, this text is true for you every day, every minute of your entire life. We need to own it. We need to increase in it. The most wise among us haven't even grazed the surface of God's wisdom. So much to grow in. The most loving and compassionate among us can't even be compared to the one who is love. We have so much to learn, so much to grow in, and the Lord is willing to show us. You could become 100 times more godly and still need to grow in godliness. It doesn't stop, we own it we increase in it. Let's keep going in the text. The next section here says, if you own this, if you're increasing in this, what does it say? Look at the text. It says, it will keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful. It will keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful, another amazing benefit of owning these qualities. And I can prove it to you because none of us wanna be ineffective or unfruitful. Nobody. I'll, I'll prove it to you, okay? Ask yourself this question. Did anyone wake up this week and say, I can't wait to get to work to not earn a paycheck? Nobody says that. No one says, I can't wait to get to work to uh, be in that group and get that project done that has no meaning. Nobody says that. No one says, I can't wait to ra raise my kids so that they're rebellious. 
never has happened. We put hard work in and we want return. We put hard work in and we want there to be fruit. We want hard work in and we want it to be effective. You know why? Because you're a child of God. You were made in his image and he's created you to be effective and fruitful. In the, in the Greek, uh, the word ineffective is argos. I'm not talking about the football team. You can take that how you want, but it's in the Bible, so. Um, it literally means the opposite of working. It means lazy, useless, slow, idle. Uh, unfruitful uh, means that you are bringing no glory to God in what you're doing. You, being unfruitful isn't just stationary. You're actually moving against God's kingdom. You're either for or you're not. You can't just be still. Being still is moving in the wrong direction. We want to be fruitful. We want to be effective ministers of God's kingdom. To own these qualities in verses five and seven keep us from being useless and unfruitful. And I pray that our church would never become a place like this that is unfruitful and ineffective. When my parents um, were younger than me, uh, they were newly married. Uh, my, my father was a pastor and finished seminary and got his first job as a pastor at a church. And um, my parents must have been 25. And uh, he was at this church in a downtown area um, in, a, in a city, and uh, the congregation was older. Nothing against older people in the congregation, love you, need you, um, but it just was older, and there, there wasn't many young people or new families in a long time. And my parents, uh, being young and vigorous, they still are young, don't tell them I said anything else, all right? Especially my mom. They wanted to bring the community in. They wanted to do some outreach in the neighborhood and, and bring people into the pews so that they could hear the word of God preached and maybe they would become saved. So they had an outreach event. And this is a small church and they had an outreach event and hundreds of people came, praise the Lord. Hundreds and hundreds of people came. It was packed, packed. And during this event, uh, people needed to use uh, the washroom as people do. And so they went into the church and they, they used the facilities and, and then left and, and that's fine. The event was over, big success. Well, later that week, uh, my dad gets a note from the board and is saying that, um, you know, we are very upset that people from outside of our church would come in and use our washrooms. Somebody left the window open and we could have been robbed. We don't like outsiders in here. This is our church, not theirs. Uh, that's sad. Think about, think about the implications of the heart that that is coming from. Now, I don't know these people. This is before I was born. But think of the heart that that has to come from. That isn't coming from a heart that is owning and increasing in these qualities. I can assure you of that. My prayer is our church would never come to a place where we're upset that people are coming in here to use our washrooms because it's ours. How not kingdom-minded is that? Becoming very ineffective and unfruitful. My parents left that church. The Lord called them to another place to minister, and after that, a number of years, that church shut down no longer exists as a church. I don't know what the building's being used for, probably condos, I don't know. The Lord removed the lampstand from their church. And no longer is it a place that is heralding the gospel. No longer is it a place where people can come and find the grace of God and the story of Jesus Christ and be saved. It doesn't exist in a needy, community. Oh Lord, keep us from that. 
And the way we will be kept from becoming another statistic about churches shutting down is if we own this and increase in this personally and then corporately will be effective and fruitful for God's ministry. But don't miss the positive side of this text either. Because if we are owning this, if we are increasing this, if we really take our faith by the horns and we say, this is what I'm going after, we can be effective and fruitful ministers of God's grace to this community for his kingdom and for his glory. Now that's something to get fired up about. How, Lord, how do I become effective? Well, grow in these things. All right, let's do it. Let's grow. Let's own it. Let's increase. Let's see more people celebrating with us in heaven because we have decided that we're going hard after our faith. We cannot let time slip by. We need to own it. We need to increase in it. And and loved ones, this is why in Christian ministry, for all of us, character always comes before competence. Character always comes before competence. You could be the best singer this world has ever seen, but if your character isn't there, if you're not growing in these qualities, if you haven't owned this and are increasing in this, how can you be fruitful for God? God uses the weakest among us because it's him doing the work. Your gifts will only take you as far as your character will allow. Or as someone very wisely said to me, your gifts may take you where your character can't sustain you. And Lord forbid that we would in our own pride and arrogance, thinking that we're the greatest thing since sliced bread, crowbar ourselves into ministry when our character isn't in a good place because our giftedness seems flashy or good in man's eyes. No, no, let your character increase. Loved ones, increase and own these qualities and the Lord will use you for effective and fruitful ministry. Peter then switches uh, in verse nine to this this other person. He says, for whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind. And uh, in the the Greek, it it really says, um, uh, this person is so blind and nearsighted. And and it's kind of confusing because you're like, well, you can't be blind and nearsighted. Either you're nearsighted or you're blind, right? You can't really be one and the, you can't be both, you're one or the other. But what he's trying to say is, and it's, it's just hard to translate, is he's, he's, he's giving to willful intent. He's saying that you have blinded yourself. You're making yourself nearsighted and blind. You're doing it to yourself. You're putting on a blindfold over your face. You're a believer in Jesus Christ, but you're putting yourself in a dark room and you can't see the light. You're self-mutilating your eyes so that you can no longer see This isn't someone else's fault. You're not a victim. This is your own doing in your life. You have been drawn away into the pleasures of this world and are blinding yourself to to Jesus Christ and his saving work for you on the cross. You've made the choice not to seek after God, but to seek after your own pleasures and passions. I have an illustration on the screen here, and hopefully this will help us understand this a little bit more, all right? So follow along with me. I want you to imagine that your uh, whole life is swimming in the ocean, all right? Maybe some of you feel like that, especially parents, right? You just feel like you're swimming in the ocean all the time. But maybe if you could just with me for a minute, imagine your whole life is just swimming in the ocean, okay? And so if you're inside this circle here, you are saved, all right? You're swimming in this part of the ocean. God has called you there, and he has made you a child of God, and you are swimming in this part of the ocean. You're, sa- you're in the saved circle, okay? And I want to make this very, very, very crystal clear that if you are called to be in this circle, if you are called into salvation, 
You cannot lose your salvation. There's nothing you can do that will separate you from the love of God. All right, we're talking to believers here. You are secured. We're just talking about do you know and have assurance of your salvation? And that's going to make the difference in your fruitfulness in life, all right? So the next slide here has kind of the outside world, all right? Passions, desires, sinfulness, the world with the unsaved. Those who have not been or have not yet been called by God to swim in the circle of salvation. All right, next slide here has this lovely little boat. That's my boat. And uh, we'll call that the SS Assurance, okay? We wanna get on that boat, because when we're on that boat, we can know that we're saved. We're on the SS assurance. I have assurance of my salvation. But maybe you're like this guy. Little X there in the ocean. Maybe you're like this guy. And uh, maybe you were on the boat, you were saved in Jesus Christ, but you've kinda jumped off the boat. You're still in the save circle, but you're not swimming hard anymore. You've not made these qualities and virtues your life's mission. You have stopped swimming and you're starting to drift. And as you start to drift, you become this guy. And you're so far away from the boat You're looking at the line between the saved and the unsaved that you can't even tell yourself if you're a saved person, if you're a child of God. Your assurance is gone. You can't even see the boat from where you are almost. The people on the boat can't even tell. They're like, he's so close to the line, I have no idea if he's saved. Your life is so upside down, you have fallen trapped to your own blindness and you're seeking after the passions and the desires of this world. You're giving in to temptation again and again and you're not seeking Christ. You have fallen in love with what you have been saved from. And the word goes on and says that this person is not only so blind and nearsighted that they have forgotten They have forgotten that they were cleansed from their former sins. You're out there, you're not swimming because the passion isn't in you. You have forgotten that you've been saved from this world. Well, church, if that's you, let me remind you. Let me remind you that God loves you that God wants you, that God wants to use you. Let me remind you that God, who created all things, every one of the trillions and trillions of stars, the one who created our galaxy and our solar system and our planet and every living being on it, the one who is causing your heart to beat right now, him, he loves you. And you didn't love him you loved this world, you loved your sin and you lived in it. And even though you were spitting in the face of God, he chose to love you. And he sent his perfect and holy and righteous son to this earth, not victoriously, but as a baby, humbly coming. And he lived a perfect life. And he grew up perfectly. And then he went to the cross to die unrighteously for you for your sins, for what you have done. He didn't have to do this, but he did it because he loves you. And then he rose again, and he defeated Satan, sin, and death. And how can we now forget? How can we now run back to the world and to the pleasures of this world that are fallen and evil and want to destroy us? How can we swim so close to that line that we don't even know we're children of God? Loved ones, loved ones, listen, listen. The gospel 
is too incredible to forget. The gospel is too incredible to forget. Allow the truth of the gospel to pour over your life every day. Allow your heart, your, my stubborn heart, to be refreshed by the truths of God's love every day. And I can tell you this, you will own your faith. You will increase in it. You will become effective. You will become fruitful for the kingdom of God. And you won't live in unassurance. You will live in glory and assurance that you are saved and a child of God. Don't forget that we were once far off and children of wrath and now are children of God. After all of this, Peter goes on in verse 10 and says, Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So if we want to confirm our election and calling, which is having assurance that we're saved, this is our third point. We must practice it. We must practice it. The goal here is to know that we are saved, to have assurance of our salvation. In these, in these, purses, sorry, in these verses, Peter is saying that uh, if we know we're going to heaven, if, if we can see that we're having this entrance into this eternal kingdom, we need to confirm our election and calling. And we do that by practicing. We do that by practicing, and if we do that, we will never fall. We will never fall away from knowing we are children of God. So the question is, am I practicing these things? Am I practicing these things? Am I, am I being diligent in confirming my election? You see the urgency again? Don't let it, don't let it fly by you. Look, sit in the text of the urgency Peter is calling out to believers of Jesus Christ. Am I being diligent in confirming my election by growing in my virtue or moral excellence? In increasing in my knowledge of God by studying his word? Am I wanting that? Am I, am I growing in self-control over my earthly passions? Is that changing in me? Am I increasing my capacity in patience? Am I doing whatever I can to become more godly? Or am I letting day and day go by continuing to be the same? Am I learning to have a greater affection for my brothers and sisters in Christ? Am I learning to love as Christ has loved? I love the urgency in this text. Be all the more diligent because he's laid out those two options. He's shown us if we're on the boat or we're close to the line and he's saying, now, since you know this truth, since you've heard it, since I've told it to you guys, you can't sit idly. You have to be all the more diligent all the more diligent, even more. Be diligent, wake up. You know how important this is. Don't live your life and be ineffective and unfruitful for the kingdom. Strive to grow in Christ. Confirm your calling and election. And we've seen that you must add to your faith, you must own your faith, and now practice your faith to have assurance of faith. Confirm your election. Well, you may ask me, um, okay, that sounds great. I'm on board. I want to practice. But how do I practice? How do, how do I do this? Well, one way to practice is something you can do right now. All right? Right now, uh, since the beginning of the service, and you know your phone's been buzzing in your pocket every four minutes, and you haven't reached down to grab it and be distracted by it, that's self-control. Congratulate, you've been growing in self-control since you sat down in the worship center today. All right? Thank you, Lord. Fruit of the Spirit. All right? After the service, we're going to be out in the lobby, and you have the opportunity to grow in brotherly affection, to find that person who needs prayer. We're the, we're the children of God. We come to church. Can I pray for you? What's going on in your life? Not just, I'm fine. No, you're not. Maybe you are, praise the Lord, but maybe you're not, and can I pray for you? Brotherly affection. How about every single thought that is entering your mind at every moment of every day? 
Are you going to choose to dwell in the thoughts of the flesh or are you going to dwell in the thoughts of the spirit? That's a discipline. That's owning and growing. That's making it your own. You have the opportunity every single day, every single moment for the rest of your life to grow. And Peter here is saying, don't wait. Don't wait. Do this now before you drift so far that you can't even see where you're supposed to swim to. I could sit here and list 10 needs off the top of my head that our church has in terms of people serving in the church. Ministries that are short leaders or teachers or workers, it's constant. There's a list. I'm not gonna do that. I'm not, gonna, I'm not just gonna give those to you. Because what I really think that this text is pointing at is the heart. And I think that someone who is owning this and increasing in this is gonna go out and find out, how can I serve? What are the needs in my church? How can I show brotherly affection to my brothers and sisters in Christ? How can I be effective? How can I be fruitful? I'm seeking, I'm wanting, Lord, use me. And you're gonna find out what that job is that no one else wants to do, but you're gonna do it passionately and with humility and with grace and faithfully and with steadfastness and with self-control and you're gonna grow more like Jesus Christ. There's your opportunity. Find the need and fill it. Show the Lord that you're taking this seriously, that you want assurance of your salvation, that you want to be effective, that you want to be useful for his kingdom. Another way that we can have assurance of our salvation is just asking ourselves this simple question is, was there a moment in my life where I changed? Maybe it wasn't a split second, maybe it was a couple of months, I don't know your story, but am I not the person that I would be if I didn't have Christ? Am I different because of the spirit who is within me? Am I changing? Or do you examine your life and say, well, nothing's really changed, actually. I just come to church every Sunday, and I thought that that's what got me in. You have a false assurance of your salvation. To have true assurance of salvation, we must know that the spirit of God is living in us. If you can, if you can know that for sure, because your life has been transformed, then you have assurance. If you, if you were saved in Jesus Christ and you've lived the last month, year, five years, 10 years, so far away from him, you need to come back. He still loves you, he's still sure that you're saved, but you might not be. You need to swim hard towards the Lord. You need to increase and own this thing and become effective and fruitful. If you've never been saved, you can do that right now. You can say to the Lord, God, I have never trusted in you. I thought that if I just worked harder, I would have favor in your eyes. But Lord, I see now that I need to trust fully that Jesus Christ's work saved me. I give my life to you. You can say that prayer in your seat right now. If you've been so far off and you need to come back, listen, there is so much grace, so much grace offered to you. So much grace. Get on the boat. Swim hard. Be effective. If we want to have that sweet assurance, we need to practice these qualities and see the work of God in our lives. Then we can truly say, loved ones, we can truly say, I know that I know. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, God, for your continued love, grace, your Holy Spirit who teaches us and leads us, God. Lord, we thank you that you are faithful. Lord, even when we are not, God, you, you pursue us, you seek after us, God, you call us back to you, God. You wanna use us. You want us to be effectful, you want us to be fruitful. And so God, I pray right now, Lord, as your spirit is in this place, God, would you convict us, God? Would you show us areas of our life that we have been ignoring to change because we love this world? Oh Lord, show us a greater joy. Show us a greater passion, Lord. Show us a greater 
love. Be with us now as we continue to sing to your great name. We pray this all in Jesus' name.